Congreso Futuro. Ideas para cambiar el mundo. Del 14 al 20 de enero. Síguelo en congresofuturo.cl Es hora de nuestra charla magistral del día. Invitamos al escenario a Amber Case. Ella es licenciada en Sociología y Antropología en el Lewis and Clark College, Estados Unidos. Trabaja como investigadora en el Instituto del Futuro en Palo Alto, California. Sus investigaciones se centran en el mundo cyborgs, humanos interactuando con la tecnología. Postula además que la tecnología no necesariamente tiene que implantarse, puede ser una extensión física o mental, argumentando que en estos días somos dos seres, uno digital y otro físico. ¡Bienvenida! Good morning, everyone. Could you hold up your phones really quickly? Some of you are already holding them up. Great. Ah, it's good. Uh, I would like to tell you that you are all cyborgs. You don't have to be Robocop or Terminator to be a cyborg. Every time you use a piece of technology or a tool, you're acting in a techno-social relationship. And our tools were originally to extend the capability of our fists or to a knife to extend the capability of our teeth. But actually, even though we think of cyborgs as Terminator or Robocop, cyborg came from a 1960 paper on space travel. The idea is that you add a technology to yourself in order to adapt to a new environment. And every day in modern society, our new environment requires that we have these phones with us, these kind of wormholes that allow us to press a button, whisper something, and be heard on the other side of the world. Somebody adding this many components to their body allows them to be in a place that humans should not be. Our entire history is us alongside tools. We use them to adapt, we use them to live. But now we're in an era in which it's not only the physical extensions of ourselves, but the mental extensions of ourselves. And in fact, there's been quotes that maybe 50 billion devices could be online by 2020. It's not just us communicating with devices, but devices being on a social network communicating with each other. So when I see a quote like this, I like to ask, does this actually sound good? Is it great that we'll have 50 billion devices? Do we even have the resources to get over 50 billion devices? So let's consider some things, like the smart watch that sends you notifications from your phone. Maybe it's more convenient because you don't need to look at your phone as much. But when we try to make everything smart, like the smart fridge that tells you when the bananas have gone bad, we don't need a smart fridge to tell us the bananas have gone bad. The bananas have a peel. It changes color. It tells you. Do we need smarter technology? Or do we need smarter humans? How much should we put into our technology? How many of you have more time because of technology? Okay, follow, follow. These two people have it figured out. Talk to them after the lecture. The original promise of tech was to free up our time to make us more human. That at some point in the future, which keeps getting pushed out further and further, we would have enough technology that we wouldn't have to work anymore, that we would be free to be human again. Yet, technology like a gas seems to fill every single available space in our life. It's like a phone is like a new cigarette. Oh, you have nothing to do? Ah. Oh, I'm bored. Oh, I wake up in the morning. Now we have these things next to us that cry, and we have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep. They get hungry, and we have to plug them into the wall and feed them. We take care of them better than we do ourselves. Sometimes we wake up, and we look at them before we look at our significant other. What happens when everything in our life becomes smart technology, when we have the home of the future, when we buy all of the new things. You get what I like to call the dystopian kitchen of the future? It's a thing in which everything has a notification. Everything is trying to talk to you. Everything has a bad battery life. 
It's all connected to the web, so it takes up more bandwidth than Netflix. So you're trying to watch your favorite movie, but your fridge is communicating over it, so you can't do it. Everything requires a software update or a hardware update. And lastly, hackers are constantly trying to hack into your fridge and your home appliances so that they can Bitcoin mine and do other things with it. This is a future that, that maybe we want, maybe we don't want. But I don't know about you, but when I go home, I don't want to have to be a system administrator in my own home. I just want to go home to be home. When we start making technology that's closer to supporting human life, we can't build it like we do a desktop application. We can't build it like we do Twitter. Early Twitter would fail, and there was a fail well, and it was funny. We would laugh, oh, Twitter's down, no big deal. But this startup, PetNet, said, you don't have to worry about feeding or watering your animals. You could even Skype them. You could see them in real time. People thought, great, we'll buy the, this, this kit. And what happened was that the feeding schedule was set up to a remote server. And the server one day failed, and the pets were stranded. People couldn't Skype them. They didn't know whether they were alive or dead, the new Schrodinger's cat. And we had this big issue where people had no clue. And yet they put the trust in this software and hardware because the application developers said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about feeding and watering your pet. We haven't taken care of it. This is technology. You can trust technology. It's the future. And in the future, in all of the videos and movies that you see, you can always talk to a machine and they'll understand you the first time. Even if you have an accent, no worries. In the future, everything is perfect. Everything is glossy. In the future, nothing breaks. Or you have a dystopian future where everything is broken. I don't want either of those futures. What about a middle future? We're not going to have all one future. We're going to have ranges. We need to have to, the choice of what future we want. When programmers sell a company and they get wealthy, a lot of them either take a trip down to South America to take an ayahuasca ritual to maybe get the culture that they lost from programming, or they buy a farm and they start to work with the original code that grows out of the ground. I went and looked at PetNet, and I said, is there any responsibility? And the terms of service said, you agree not to rely on our service for the well-being of your animal. We are not responsible if your animal dies, yet we promised that this new technology would make your life easier. So it's really important to think, are there any ethics associated with this technology? We, for, we removed ethics in school, we removed art and culture and music and philosophy and all these things because they're considered, oh, unnecessary. We'll just have tech and tech will replace everything. In fact, you could upload your brain into a box and that's no problem. What about human time? When I talk to people and I say, when you're not working, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm eating with family. Even the most intense tech person, the minute they have a child, Everything is about that child. They really want to be human. The Greeks had this concept of chronos time and kairos time. And in chronos time, it's the idea that you have a meeting from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And within that meeting, you can only do the certain things in that meeting. Maybe towards the end of the meeting, you find out what you really want to do, and up, uh, the meeting is over. You go on a corporate retreat with your company, you figure out what you really need to do in the company, and then you get back, and oh no, there's an emergency. We have to cancel everything. We can never work on that. Kairos time is the time of falling in love. It's the time of a sunset. It's the eureka moment that Archimedes had when he figured out density. It's the time when you're not necessarily thinking about something. We think that if we add so much more tech to our lives and we fill every single moment up with a social network that we'll be more innovative and we'll think better and we'll be more creative. And yet I'm talking to these Nobel laureates and it's about being childlike and exploring something that nobody else cares about at the time and thinking, what if? It's about reading a book because a book, when you read it, you're adding your imagination to it and that makes it a part of you you dissolve into that technology. 
and because you're adding something to it, that's what brings it to life. So much of what we do now is consuming more than we create. So how can we be the humans we want to be to be innovative and interesting if all of our time is filled up by unnecessary notifications, worrying about whether our battery runs out, and trying to automate everything? If we have an era of interruptive technology, which I would suggest all of you at some point today take five minutes, look at your phone and ask yourself, how many of the notifications that are being sent to you are actually from a human? How many of them are from a machine? And how often when your phone beeps do you actually look at it? You can go into settings, you can turn most all of them off. You could turn your phone to airplane mode and determine when you're going to look at it. And it's hard to do. Part of what we have to do is train ourselves to do it. So we really need the opposite of an interruptive technology. If we're going to go into the future and actually build things, we need a calm technology. And this is not my idea. This is, this is from Xerox Park in the 80s and 90s. I was writing my thesis on mobile phones in 2007, right when the iPhone came out. I noticed that people were starting to hold their phones like this and absorb into the phone. And it was, a, it was this big transition moment from clicking on a T9 keyboard really fast or a cool Motorola Razor phone to a complete absorption. And I showed up on some archive.org site and I found this paper called The Coming Age of Calm Technology. And there was also a paper called The World is Not a Desktop. And they said, in the future, we will have lots of technology. Technology will be really cheap, but the scarce resource will be our attention. And how technology makes or breaks our attention will make or break our future. And these papers were written in the 80s and 90s. They read just like a paper today. They don't read like a research paper. They can be read by anybody. I went online and I made a website and I put all the research on the website to try and bring it back to life. Xerox Park is where we got the graphic user interface, it's where we got Ethernet, it's where we got a lot of modern technology. And we didn't get the technology because it was just a bunch of researchers and technologists in a room. It was because the people at Xerox Park understood that we needed to hire artists, anthropologists, liberal arts people to counter the technology so that we could make a human-machine interface that worked in harmony. You can't have one without the other. If we have a future that's pure technology, we have automated systems in an airport that you get stuck in because you as a human accidentally bent your boarding pass. And because it's automated, there's, when it fails, it's, it's, it's over. This is Mark Weiser's original quote on invisible tools. He says, a good tool is invisible. It's not in your face. If it's really good, you focus on the task and not the tool. When you're a carpenter and you use a hammer or a hand tool, you become one with it. It extends you. They're friendly, human-scale tools. Right now, when we're using Facebook, Facebook's algorithm, it makes us upset. Because if we're upset, we're on the site longer, we're more likely to click on things. And if we're on the site longer and click on things, they make money. So these websites are profiting off of our misery. There's only one way to present yourself online, and that's the template itself of the social network. Here is the box for you. Here is where you put your photo, and this is how you will behave. The interface is the culture, and there is this very depressive culture that's permeating through the world because depression is profitable. Early on, you would make your own chat room or forum, and if you didn't like it, you could leave and make another one. If somebody was suicidal or getting abused, you could kick them out. At this large scale, you don't know who's running the show. You don't know the individual engineer who wrote that code. And if you do put a support ticket in, maybe it could be responded to in 30 days. It could be life or death. Because we've moved away from human scale, we're a one-size-fits-all culture. And that doesn't leave any room for weirdness and creativity, doesn't leave any room for making music, it just leaves room for the same thing. Maybe we have reached peak singularity. Maybe early on the singularity was about sharing cute cat videos. 
Now it's about getting upset about a political comment online, making an argument with somebody and then hating them. Families splitting apart, people getting divided among social class, gender, race, because they're upset with each other and the social network's just making money off these divisions. We have to make a future together. We have to look instead at human universals. Everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to eat with friends. Everybody might want something to believe in, whether they're atheist or not, but they can believe in science, they can believe, but people want to do something. And oftentimes the answer is having people do something at human scale instead of this big scale. So how do we design calm technology? Because I can talk about the philosophy of what we should do, but it means nothing if we don't go back in time and see what Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown said. The very first thing they said is that technology shouldn't take up all of our attention, just some of it and only when necessary. A silly example of this is just a tea kettle. A tea kettle, you set it, you forget it, it shouts to you when it's ready. It's not entirely calm, but you can do something else. You're not staring at it, you're not Bluetoothing into the tea kettle and having a countdown. You're not updating the software on the tea kettle. It's a tea kettle, either analog where it works under its own heat or you plug it into the wall. And this is a really important thing to, to remember is that the tea kettle, you can do something else while this is happening and it will tell you when it's done. This is using peripheral attention. So right in front of our vision, we have high resolution visual attention. As we go out, we have lower resolution attention. We can hear things, we can feel things through touch. We have lower resolution, but we still have information. A lot of our culture right now in tech is about focusing you in on this small screen, whether it's a pad or a tab or a board, as Mark Weiser called it in the 80s.